Recent activism in the UK has made worldwide headlines. By bringing cultural treasures into the discussion, it raises new anxieties and questions about what is at stake. The visual impact of the soup hitting the Van Gogh painting was viscerally shocking to many, including myself. On reflection, it reminded me of when the painter Francis Bacon was asked what he would save in a burning house if the choice was between a Rembrandt self-portrait and a cat. Without hesitation, Bacon said the cat, emphasising the value of life over art. With that in mind, the Living Planet report shows that animal populations have declined by 70% since 1970. This is mass extinction territory, and it is the world that these protesters are trying to draw the wider public's attention to. Regardless of what we think of their action, the post-war boomer generation and my own that have succeeded it have partaken in this destruction both of the complex web of life on Earth and also the dreams and aspirations of the next and every successive generation. In this Climate Gen episode, recorded a few weeks ago with author, philosopher and former Exile spokesman Professor Rupert Reed and his colleague, systems and culture change strategist Paddy Loughton, we discuss the urgent need for a mobilisation of moderate masses in what they define as a moderate flank. Social tipping points occur when the force of change can no longer be held back. But what does a moderate flank actually look like? Thanks for listening to Climate Gen. You can support my work via Patreon, subscribe for free on YouTube and all major podcast channels. Please do leave feedback in whatever way you can. Okay, so Paddy and Rupert, thank you very much for joining me today, specifically to discuss this moderate flank. And I'd like you to sort of tell me what it is. I mean, are we talking about a movement? Are we talking about something someone can join? Or is it is it something that can be applied like a, a tool or a process or something? Can you help us understand it from that perspective? Well, maybe I'll make a little start on that and then Paddy can come in because I think an important initial clarification is that, no, it's almost certainly not gonna be a movement if by a movement you mean something which can be identified as kind of one thing, which is sort of under one umbrella. Um, part of what defines it is that it's going to be a lot uh, bigger and more pluralistic than that. What we're really talking about is a phenomenon which is starting to emerge across a wide variety of institutions, workplaces, businesses. We could talk also about it in geographical communities. We could talk about it in civic society. We could talk about it in politics. It's going to be uh, much less unified than something like uh, Extinction Rebellion, for example, uh, and much more organic and, and bottom up, I think. And what we're really trying to do is to name and to encourage and support and facilitate and to sense make around something which is already starting to emerge and, and like I say it's going to be it's going to be much bigger than anything any one person could uh, could own yeah I think that's um that's certainly how I see it it's it's a really really helpful addition from a sort of theoretical point of view to understanding what's going on and as Rupert says being able to put a name to it um much of this sort of activity has existed in many forms already um some of it perhaps not going as far as it might need to eventually. Um, and what Rupert is proposing here as an understanding of the dynamics of that um, is really helpful for helping those things to identify each other uh, and for other things to sort of find their way into this broad um, evolving uh, praxis, I suppose. Um, it's, it's an interesting term, moderate, because it, if it is a theoretical term, it can apply to both the praxis uh, in relation to radical activity like what extinction rebellion has been doing for example um but it can also apply to the people joining it as people who are moderate in in relation to their understanding of what's going on and how they want to respond to it so with those things in mind there's a lot of different dimensions here that um, people can engage with in terms of getting involved in something the way that rupert's describing what then kind of emerges here is very interesting and connects to a lot of other theory or, or understanding that's evolved recently. The idea of emergent strategy, the idea that what comes out here is a sort of flocking, if you like, of different efforts mm. that are coordinated, that are connected underground a bit mycelial-like, mm. that are sharing resources and insight, but operating in different ways in different places, a bit like Jasmine and the Jasmine Revolution was, was named accordingly. 
uh, as a good friend of mine was telling me recently. Um, that That is a good way to think about this. And certainly one of the strategic frames I like to think about is how can we manifest a symphony instead of a cacophony mm. uh, in mm-hmm. the moment, a symphony that can become powerful against some very powerful forces that are currently dominating the situation, particularly at a communications level, uh, to help people find each other, gather together and uh, do what's required. Paddy is working hard in, in that communications aspects of, aspect of this, what hopefully may become more of a sort of a, a symphony. The, the mycelium analogy is a very powerful one, one that we use a lot and that we use in transformative adaptation, which I see as part of this general picture. And also it's worth, of course, acknowledging, as Paddy says, that there already was or is a, a moderate flank. What we're talking about here is something which is, hoping to add to that or to emerge to some extent from that, but also, and crucially, from the, the space that has been opened up by the radical flank. And I guess the way I see it is that the greatest compliment that anyone can pay to the work that the radical flank did, especially in 2019, is to exploit that space, is to exploit fully that new consciousness opportunity and make it available to a lot more people, uh, most of whom are never going to join a radical flank. I remember in the post COP21 sort of space, talking to scientists, quite eminent scientists. And we and the problem that we faced then was that the response to these exponential problems was not nowhere near exponential. And we needed a social tipping point. Is this where we're going with this moderate flank? Are we talking about a sort of a tipping point in the social space, a sort of a, a means to exponentiate our response to the climate crisis? I think the short answer to that is yes. Uh, we are very keen on the, the tipping points analogy. I mean, the beauty of thinking about things in terms of tipping points, of course, as you imply, Nick, is on, on the one hand, you've got all the bad, terrifying tipping points that uh, are starting to emerge, we're starting to get close to, and that needs to be counterposed by some good uh, tipping points. And so, yes, what we need to do is to scale up and rapidly. So what was really exciting in 2019 was to see the radical flank doing that through Extinction Rebellion, through Greta Thunberg and other stuff going on in other countries and around the world, of course. Uh, something similar needs to happen to that in a more moderate space and in a, in a much bigger uh, space and on a much bigger scale. And that is potentially possible, we now believe. We think it's inevitable, in fact, that there will be more climate activism in the 20s, and it's inevitable that huge numbers of people want to come on board, not necessarily to activism, though. Many of them will want to be taking action, but will not want to identify themselves as activists. This is inevitable. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to welcome it? Are we going to try to support it? Or are we going to try and force these people to jump over hoops and if we do we may find that quite a lot of them fall at those hurdles and that we don't make don't take full advantage of the situation so yeah we need to add to the certainty that there are going to be more people coming on board more people interested in this to to seek to co-create what will be truly uh, a tipping point and that's got to be one of our last best hopes of doing what is necessary in order to avert um, well, in my opinion, climate-driven societal collapse. You mentioned climate activism then, which is obviously, you know, a lot of the work that we all do is, is around climate activism and climate change. But at the moment, we've got a, a sort of a landscape of really bad interconnected issues. And we've got an ecological mm. crisis, but we've got an economic crisis. We've got, a co- you know, the cost of living. We've got conflict. We've got energy crisis, supply chain issues. and when the ordinary person looks at that, climate might be in there somewhere, but it's a, it's a really quite horrifying outlook for at least, you know, as far as you can see into the future. Um, yeah. The climate side of that, is the, even at the military level, has been called a, a threat multiplier. Is there a way to help the individual through this sort of mod- moderate flank who must be feeling... I mean, I, I think I do, and I'm, you know, quite in tune with some of this stuff, but quite lost in and amongst all of this. Yeah, I think uh, Paddy should go first on this one because Paddy's been working precisely on this kind of interpenetration of the current crises. Yeah, thanks. I, I think there's 
and going back slightly as well with the idea of the social tipping point, which applies here, there's um, there's a social change theory framework, uh, which I think Joanna Macy and, and Mickey Cashtown and others have sort of um, propagated, which is suggests there are three stages. One, you have to understand and experience, importantly, experience what is wrong. Number two, you have a vision of what could be better. And number three, you pursue that vision in a supportive community. Um, and what, what often happens is that people are sort of denied each of those stages in the situation. But what, what seems to be the case at the moment is that a lot of people are actually at sort of stage two here. And what they're missing is the dimension of stage three that allows them to come together. Um, and so that can also be, be called pluralistic ignorance in psychological terminology, um, where people can be sitting, feeling or thinking something within a community group, um, but being afraid of expressing it, because if they do, then they might be ostracized because they don't think anyone else thinks or feels what they feel. Um, when actually often what's going on is that the whole group, maybe even, or at least a majority that is thinking and feeling exactly the same thing. And what is required is for a reveal of that being the situation. And then that is a tipping point. Things can change very quickly. Mm -hmm. And there are case studies of this happening throughout history where a sudden change can occur when that sort of reveal is made. And so in a way, what we're talking about here is, is having to help people come into an understanding of the, yes, the interconnection of these crises and that they, they share root causes and be that we can tackle those root causes by coming together and that our power multiplies uh, to deal with the threat multiplying. Um, through that kind of connection. That's that's very difficult to do in a way because our systems are reliant on us being atomized, but it's absolutely the effort. And speaking to certain people, John Alexander, mutual friend, for example, who would, he would say that the, the key priority is r radically changing our democratic systems to enable that kind of coming together, that kind of collective sense-making, that kind of collective acting. And that, that really is the only way we can we can deal with this. So something about what moderate flank is describing as an opportunity is that opportunity for people to come into recognition that what they are thinking and feeling is very much normal, is very much what most people are thinking and feeling. And that actually through coming together in that shared understanding, we can start getting into the shared action that will um, help us deal with these multiplying threats together. Yeah, and one aspect of that, which is, in my opinion, absolutely critically important, is that what we need to do if we're going to have a successful emergent moderate flank is to appeal to people in their identities as uh, workers, as people who live where they do, and as parents and grandparents. And this is something which has been, of course, happening more in recent years. But my view is there's still a lot further to go on that. And this is why I'm excited, for example, by some of the work that Paddy and others have been doing, suggesting that if we're wanting to really engage people with the climate crisis in the context of a cost of living crisis, we need to show how those two come together. And we need to do that through appeal to the interest that we all have in if you will, parenting the future together, that we all want our children and our nephews and nieces to have a better future. And they're not gonna have that future if they've got no money, but they're also not gonna have that future if they've got no climate. <laughs> and there's a, a way through all of this. And you know we know what it is. It's to do with insulating our homes properly. It's to do with using renewable energy. It's to do with relocalizing our society and not having such high, fossil fuel burdens in the transport system and so on and so forth. It, it's in that sense, really quite commonsensical. Uh, and in that sense, if we manage to get this through to people and, and get them thinking, taking seriously their protective role as parents of the future, as parents of their own, own children and as co-responsible for, for everybody's, then it seems to me there really is a possibility for us to address these crises, the Ukraine crisis, the cost of living crisis, the climate crisis, all at the same time. One of the interesting things is the climate vulnerable nations who have been pushing for you know, loss and damage and all these kinds of things have had pushback even up to you know, the recent days with John Kerry saying, oh God, you know, where the, where's the money going to come from? Um, and when I've spoken to people from the Climate Vulnerable Forum, they said, well, we know we're not going to get it from them in the way that we need. So we're forming a coalition of the willing where people can come. And I think European countries just pledge 
12 or 13 million, but it, it's not enough, but it's just a symbolic at this stage. And that's the sort of coalition of the willing, which will hopefully start to snowball. Is this coalition of the willing sort of similar conceptually to the moderate flank with the expectation that as momentum builds and as uh, pressure bears down, that this sort of everything starts to accelerate? I can comment on this. Yeah, I, I think there are similarities, absolutely. And it comes back to that point about the, this kind of idea of a symphony or, or flocking efforts that are quite different in different places, um, that represent different people, represent different issues, represent different communities, but who share this uh, experience of being oppressed, oppressed by the quote unquote system or set of systems of power. Um, and that, of course, is happening at the global stage in a horrific sense and has been for a long time at, at scale. And part of the genius uh, of the, the loss and damage demand is that it, it reveals the nature of that oppression quite starkly, because what it's what it's actually asking is for a, a kind of inversion of the relationship between uh, global north and, and global south countries, shifting it from explo- exploitation and extraction towards uh, essentially giving. Um, and that reveals how much that system depends on the current relationship. Um, so there's there's a genius demand in that. An interesting question is, well, what's the equivalent here? And maybe it's what Rupert is saying. There are common sense demands that people are making in this country. They're already being rejected. The UK population want insulation. The UK population want renewable energy development. The government is doing the, the opposite of that. So there's already that rejection, already that question, well, what are we doing? You might point to the emergence of the new trade union movement as a sort of suggestion of that kind of response. The enough is enough campaign, the don't pay campaign. These are sort of indicators of, of something building there. It's an opportunity that ideally we all grasp and we all become a part of as far as possible in a progressive kind of movement of movements sense to avoid that becoming a target and becoming destroyed by the powers. But yeah, I, I think there's also an interesting suggestion here or, or possibility for what people are experiencing here as oppression, essentially, um, to uh, start to sort of, or, or people ex- experiencing, that, experiencing that to start acknowledging gradually how that oppression is linked to the oppression that is happening at a wider level, that it is ultimately being caused by the same uh, set of systems that we have designed based on the misunderstanding of basic reality and a set of values that are kind of out of touch with that. Uh, And that if we can all together sort of course correct, as it were, um, then we can together tackle that and overcome that and come to something different, something more beautiful um, that serves us all better and serves life going forward. And that's extremely idealistic. But at the moment, certainly trying to talk to people in this country about the suffering of people elsewhere is very, very difficult to do, Um, partly because they can't relate to it literally. It's very difficult to encourage people to connect to it, partly because they feel rightly in a way complicit in that suffering and feel guilty and, you know, turn away from it and lead towards denial um, if we we present it. But yeah, in the long run, there is perhaps an opportunity for these things to become related and for people fighting oppression here to learn from those efforts elsewhere have been fighting oppression for their you know entire existence almost a couple of points really one is you mentioned the symphony is there a conductor or is there a, a series of conductors f- throughout yeah it's a, it's a really good question and it's a it's kind of a difficult one to answer there are needs here for fractal type activity to be emerging then obviously that has sort of initiators involved in that process but there's a danger of ending up with sort of singular figures um being too powerful in the situation as with with any system so we sort of need to try and avoid that but it's from it's a strategic question and it's difficult to get around because we still carry this individualistic mindset even in the spaces where we are trying to get away from that. So it's, it's, it's a really important question and a really essential part of the challenge in involving these kinds of things is to essentially avoid the trap, I would suggest of that. But uh, Rupert, what do you think? Well, yeah, I'll just add to that, that in terms of the, the work that we're doing around building uh, this new moderate flank. So I run along with my colleague, Liam Kavanagh, uh, an incubator, a moderate flank incubator that is funded. And we're trying to support and facilitate some of this. But That's, in a certain sense, all we're trying to do, apart from, you know, offering some thought leadership and so on and so forth. As we said right at the start of this, this is not going to be a a sort of centralised movement. And really the most important aspect of this, and this is what I would say above all to everyone watching and listening, is that if this is going to be real, it's going to be real because 
huge numbers of people decide to make it so and those huge numbers start with with you the the most important aspect the most important part of the nature of the emerging moderate flank is going to be more or less bottom-up activity happening in people's professions workplaces businesses where they live in those kinds of aspects of their life and it's going to be formed out of the the confluence of huge numbers of these and of the growing sense that oh look it's not just happening here where i live or it's not just happening here where i work it's happening over here and over there and over there and then we start to get this sense of the of the symphony and this kind of sense making around numbers we get into a virtuous circle rather than a vicious circle of kind of hopelessness and despair we get a virtuous circle of actually you know what we're starting to to do this uh, and then the, hopefully the the seeds are, are ready for when the the ground is is fertile enough for when the next climate disaster comes along when the next political opportunity comes along and so on and so forth does that make sense now yeah i understand and I, we live in in a polarized society and there's a, often a risk that counter narratives pop up, which, but what they tend to do is reinforce the status quo. And we get that a lot in the UK, especially with the, the state of the mainstream media. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, how the, the moderate flank could potentially be effective in unifying people yeah. in the midst of all this culture war, bitter division, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. It's such a crucial question. Let me make a start on it. So obviously, we've already touched on some of this. We want to reach people in their identities as, for instance, parents, which is something that to the vast majority of us share. And those of us who don't, like myself, typically aunts or uncles or guardians or whatever it might be. And we want to, in that sense, really try to draw people's attention again and again to the more uh, that we have uh, in common uh, and to use that as the basis for action that is commonsensical in relation, for example, to the confluence of the Ukraine climate and cost of living crises, as we were saying earlier. Now, we think it is imperative to do this in a way that actively resists polarization. That is part of the point of being genuinely inclusive. So we really mean it. We want to appeal to small C conservatives. We want to appeal to uh, working class people who think that uh, activism is something middle class and nothing to do with them. And we want to say to them, not um, you're wrong. We want to say to them, uh, well, Get on board in a way that suits you. It doesn't need to be activism. We just need you to be doing something which pushes all in the same kind of uh, direction. You might think of this in terms of spiral dynamics, if that means anything to you as a, as a genuine effort to be teal rather than just green in the way that, that we organize. As I said before, it's about being genuinely inclusive. It's about mainstreaming something, which by definition, really, the radical flank can't do. So, you know, I was uh, so proud to be a part of the Radical Flank for uh, a couple of years uh, up until 2020, and, and we achieved something very real. But part of the way we did that is by polarizing. That was part of the strategy of Extinction Rebellion, was to force a conversation that involves some polarization. And what I now believe and we now believe is that it's necessary to move in the opposite direction. It's necessary to move in the direction deliberately of having had that consciousness shift, bringing our shared attention to the way that we do share fundamentally what we need in relation to this. And that the narratives that are used to divide us just have to be overcome if there's going to be a way through this. So the question you've asked, it couldn't be uh, more important in my view and I am genuinely hopeful it's going to be very difficult but I am genuinely hopeful that that we can achieve this if we're serious uh, about appealing to people who are not activists ab about appealing to people who are small c conservative about appealing to people who for example don't buy into intersectionalist identity politics you know all of these difficult kind of coalitions and alliances beyond what the, the left or the Green Party or whatever feels comfortable with. This is what has to occur if we're actually going to have something which truly is a mass phenomenon, which can achieve the kind of uh, critical mass that is required for the kind of system change that is required if we're going to actually address climate breakdown adequately. Paddy, do you want to add to that in any way? 
Yeah, just to say, I mean, just to reinforce the idea that, that you know, we have more in common and that the, the, the visions that are manufactured really in our cultures and societies, obviously there are, there are some elements in that are real, but it's, it, it's absolutely encouraged um, off the back of perverse incentives for, you know, social media platforms and of course, perverse political incentives. And to cut through against that is obviously very difficult when most of the noise people are hearing is reinforcing or, or worsening those divisions. But the opportunity lies in the truth being that we have more in common and that people intuitively understanding that and being able to come into spaces where they connect to that quite quickly and outcomes come from that that are mutually beneficial quite quickly. And obviously, citizens' assemblies are a great example of that uh, kind of process working very well. But certainly, so the research... Um, that Rupert mentioned that I was involved in earlier, it, you know, the, the, the priority for that is uh, it is collaborative from the off in terms of how it's being developed, in terms of who's involved in it from a broad spectrum of different, you know, political leanings and so on. Uh, and then the focus is to find messaging stories that can reach people across the political divide. And it, it is framing, like speaking about our children and their safety and security and thinking about our freedom and our, our uh, stability as a you know as a community as a nation and so on that that can do that and so we have these ways of doing it uh, the challenge remains doing so against the onslaught and the, the fire hose propaganda as it gets referred to uh, that is coming through from the other side but you know the truth can out <laughs> and we have to continue to to work with that it's also about resisting the effort, which is very attractive to be more pure than now from, as it were, our own side. Obviously, the, the, the bigger problem is the horrible money behind uh, right wing media and so on and so forth. But we should acknowledge that there's an issue with uh, forms of discourse on the left among Greens, etc., that suggest that if you're not 100 percent with us, you're against us. You know, we're going to have to get used to really genuinely working with people who are not 100% with us if we're actually serious about getting through what's coming. Okay, it seems like what is emerging is a set of principles and values. And then you you kind of need this sort of counterforce that goes out and engages with people on whatever scale, whether it's one-to-one -one or from a sort of media platform. Um, is that is that emerging already? Do you see the seeds of it? Are you... I mean, how? where do you see you are with it at the moment? Rupert, do you want to start? Well, I'll just say one thing on that, um, which is that I think you're absolutely right that it has to begin with, with some kind of principles and values. We've been talking, in effect, about what some of those values are, I think, in this conversation. And they're values which are very wide uh, and uh, encompassing. But yeah, there, there obviously have to be some uh, values, not everything or everyone uh, is uh, is included here, otherwise there'd be no endeavour uh, at all. So uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is to find ways of describing what those principles and values are, which are enticing and attractive and um, genuinely inclusive to the degree possible and that pulled together some of the kinds of things we've been talking about in this conversation so that's a space to to keep watching but it's also something again that everybody needs to be involved in and one of the ways that that can be meaningfully achieved is for all these uh, nascent organizations and initiatives, which to me are part of this emerging sort of post XR uh, moderate flank, such as climate emergency centers, for example, this, this growing network uh, in the UK, for all of these to try to be as inclusive and as welcoming as possible, while being clear on what they're trying to achieve and on the absolute non-negotiable importance of that and never soft peddling on the nature of the threat that hangs over us all uh, in common, although some of us face it more immediately and extremely, of course, and that's important than others. Paddy, do you want to try and take that further? Yeah, I think one thing here is that, and this goes back a little bit to the pluralistic ignorance thing, the, a lot of the principles are in place in a sense. Like what we, we know what people value at a sort of public level. It is fairness. It is you know green. It is safe and secure future for children. Like we, the, these things are there already, and a big part of this, in a way, is sort of revealing that to people. And I think back to your point, Nick, that the challenge is 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 finding the spaces, creating the spaces to permit that uh, that encounter, if you like, or that sort of realization from people that what they are feeling, what they are seeking, is absolutely normal, and it's what most people want, and that together we'll be able to go after it. And when you look at 
efforts to sort of essentially build alternatives to the existing infrastructure we have that is arguably in the way, that's where a lot of the energy is starting to come. And that's things like Civic Square in Birmingham, things like the Alternative UK, a platform that's developing sort of new new media channels. It's even, you know, things like Double Down News. There are these, these spaces emerging for people to encounter the information and come together in groups. And I mean, one of the key things that I think Rupert said before as well is when people ask the question, what can I do as an individual? The first bit of the answer is stop thinking of, of yourself as an individual. Acknowledge that you are a, an interconnected part of a wider set of things and that through acknowledging and acting in that way, we can start to uh, change things together. And I just allude to some thinking that a scientist called Jude Curvin has been developing recently. She says we need to act local, feel global, think cosmic. When we really think about what that means, that opens up a lot of um, potential for how people can, can begin to act where they are and connect that into wider efforts and a lot of what we've been talking about already. But yeah, just to, just to reinforce that point, the, the, the values are sort of there already. Um, people are there. We need to help them realize that. Um, they need to, we need to create the conditions for them to realize that together uh, and then be able to challenge these powers that are lying to them like flatly lying to them what the conservatives are saying at the moment about cost of cost of living and energy is blatant lies and it is verging into if not already there fascism which presumably we we don't want and and i think most people don't want so huge opportunities there for uh, mobilization i'd say it's starting to to sound more tangible in, in in many respects i mean there's this sort of Thing around activism, which you could sort of see as as petitioning, as civil disobedience, as and then there's action, which for a moderate person might be recycling and or joining a march, for example. Now, as we go into the sort of moderate Frankism, if that's the right term, are we talking about now people finding the connections, finding the voice, and and then from that perspective, this whole thing is in its infancy and um, there's a lot of seeds out there but it now needs to grow together there's a lot of stuff there already yeah it's it's happening you know there's the, the sort of the future is there it's just not uh, evenly distributed yet kind of dynamic going on here so borrow from gibson and a big big part of the challenge is actually just helping people encounter this stuff and helping people to see it and recognize it and there is a deeper challenge in that as is revealed by a brilliant strategist from the us called anat shankar azorio who is a real guru when it comes to comms um, and her race class narrative structure is a very powerful way of organizing and arranging the messaging we use to be effective. That's for another time maybe. But but one thing she says is the expression, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, is actually the, the wrong way around. What's more accurate is I'll see it when I believe it. And part of the challenge here is that people, people don't believe yet. <laughs> Fully, like that these these different things can be possible. They don't believe that other people believe what they believe. Um, and so there's a real effort to sort of allow that belief to land and give it permission so that then we can see these things, we can be drawn towards these things, they can gather more energy. And that those alternatives that are currently on the margins can start to become much, much more powerful and the thing that we start to carry forward. Yeah. And on that point of I'll see it when I believe it, and in relation again to this uh, pluralistic ignorance phenomenon, Something we strongly believe in this effort to pull together and support the emerging moderate flank is that it's not true to say that being uh, moderate in your methods requires you to in any way pull back from recognizing the full truth and the full horror of the situation that we're in. On the contrary, we think that actually the so-called moderates are in a very good position to appreciate that truth fully and to be realistic about how difficult it's going to be to turn it around and how long it's going to take, which sometimes is something which radicals struggle with a bit more and like to imagine that everything can change for the better overnight, which just tragically isn't how the world uh, works. So what's crucial there is that when you accept and understand how long all of this is going to take to improve, then you are accepting and understanding that there's going to be a lot of suffering and a lot of disasters along the way. And that's part of the painful truth that we have to face up to. Now, the point is this, we can only face up to it if we face up to it together. As long as we keep on thinking that we are isolated individuals and that perhaps we, we worry, well, is it just me who's so afraid? Is it just me who thinks that things are so, so desperately bad? So we have to bring 
people's understanding and awareness of the full truth of the situation out into the open. And that is a crucial part of what we want to do here is to make it easier not to shy away from or be in any kind of soft denial about the gravity of the crisis that we face. And we believe strongly that when that process, which has been initiated by Greta and by XR and so forth, but we think needs now to be taken further, we believe that when that starts to happen more, and we think it is starting to happen more, that when that starts to happen more, then people will be in a situation to act deeply and authentically in ways that they are comfortable with or slightly uncomfortable with but not completely uncomfortable with at scale and those ways will not consist just in making demands of of others and saying x or y ought to change people will we believe increasingly be determined to take matters into their own hands now that can sound quite full-on taking matters into our own hands But what I have in mind is a whole spectrum of things, which could include things like just taking our food growing more into our own hands and taking into our own hands more the way we determine to organize and reorganize our workplaces and our and our businesses. So it could be it can start from in very accessible ways, very ground up, bottom up ways, ways that are that, as you say, Nick, are very tangible to people. And we think that part of what this mass moderate flank is going to involve, if it's going to exist and really flourish, which it has to, is exactly that kind of taking matters into our own hands, which is a very diverse thing. And actually, in my experience, it's exactly what a huge number of people now want. What people often say to me at talks and so forth is, it's very simple. They say things like, I want to know what to do. I want to know what we ought to do. They don't ask, I want to know what the government should do. They don't even ask, you know, is it as bad as everybody says or something? They feel that things are really bad. They start to get a sense of more and more people also around them realizing that. And then they want to do stuff. They want to take action. 99.9% of them don't want to glue themselves to the M25, but they want to do something which is more than anything they've ever done before. And that's where the great opportunity lies. Yeah, it's a very crucial moment when people realise how exposed they are to a series of threats, where, whether it's climate or these, these other ones that are all interrelated. Paddy, is there anything else you want to add to what Rupert just said? No, I don't think so. I think there's a... I think we've been sort of dancing around this this theory of social change. It's been quite a neat structure here of you know people coming into experience of, of what is wrong. And the problem for a long time has been it only hits home when it hits home, and that that being too late, if you like. Um, but then this is this is the whole discussion about well, too late for what? Mm. And actually, it is too late to some things. So we need to accept that and move with it and move through it, as Rupert would say. And that arguably is increasingly what is happening is that people are experiencing. The reality of where we are and they have some sense of what could be instead or what they would like it to the conditions of it or the, the quality of it at least from a values point of view but absolutely what is missing is this ability for people to come together in that understanding and in that interest in something better and take the action in grand or quite sort of small and local forms that will enable them to pursue those visions together collectively you know we're not the only people saying this obviously one of the the most profound challenges of the situation is we are a bit like a spaceship that is headed into an asteroid field and all of the communication systems are down in 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 the spaceship because we cannot collectively sense make we cannot communicate with one another because these channels have been co-opted and uh, broken by perverse incentives that foster division and make that collective sense-making impossible and action. So there's no question that that's a really big challenge in the situation, but it's through people getting around that. It's through people sort of acknowledging that problem and seeking these spaces outside of those channels and seeking these spaces, you know, IRL, if you like, um, where they can start developing these visions that they're, you know, working towards off the back of the experience they've now had of where we actually are. It gives us the energy and the opportunity. And the more that happens, the more that fractally emerges, the more chance we have of avoiding some of the worst outcomes here. Yeah, and I think there's something that's so exciting about this moment is that quite a lot of people are starting to join things up. I think the Ukraine crisis is another big step forward in that sense that this terrible crisis represents an opportunity. A lot of people are starting to get 
oh gosh, it, it all fits together. Our reliance on uh, on petro states that hold us to ransom, our absurd reliance on fossil fuels, the increased uh, cost of living, the insecurity that we face, and especially our children face. And the more that gets joined up, the more people get a sense of there must be an alternative to this, and I'm going to be a part of it. Just quickly, just that that what Rupert's saying there, there is you know, very clear evidence from this testing we're doing at the moment that people do relate these things, cost of living and climate, although, the, you know, the mainstream media is trying to pit them against each other and say they can't possibly coexist. And, you know, this is a trade off and uh, people don't uh, underneath that. They know that they're related. They know that the present and the future are connected and that their children are obviously connected through that. And, and that the solutions we have to cost of living are the ones that will help us with climate. They, they understand that intuitively. Again, it's just a case of helping people to recognize that we all share that understanding. And uh, off the back of that understanding, we can we can do what we need to do. We have that power. Power is not a zero sum game, but we often think it is. And as soon as we all together recognize it's not, that's when real change can start to become possible. Okay, so there's a sort of role of the moderate flank in a way is to use the accumulated knowledge and experience of being so long in the space to help others not shut down in the face of all of this. Um, and not become cynical and and sort of just take it, you know, and shut down, but it, to actually form alliances and join a supportive kind of community network, etc. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Someone said beautifully recently, cynicism is obedience. I thought it's quite quite good. Mm. That's very good. <laughs> Well, look, thank you very much. It's been fantastic to, to talk to you both and to learn more about this. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.